Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to give you a highly motivated good morning with much of energy, ladies and gentlemen, to the seventh day of the K2022 here at our special show, Plastics Shape the Future. Ladies and gentlemen, an exciting week lies behind us and um, we weather or we are now reflecting on what we have achieved and whether the global crisis is a curse or maybe a blessing, ladies and gentlemen, for the transformation of the plastics industry. We look forward to our president's assessment now for the first part of that agenda today, uh, followed by a groundbreaking and motivating look into the future. And I'm delighted to welcome Marco Ten Brogenkarte. He is our president, the president Plastics Europe and commercial vice president packaging specialties plastics Emir at Dauer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. And um, we're nearing the end of K2022. And I would be remiss if I wouldn't start with recognizing two teams here at the ground, Plastics Europe Germany and Plastics Europe Brussels for the phenomenal job they've done over the last 10 days to be able to put up a show. Exactly, that's it. Can I hear a round of applause for these teams? Thanks very much, because top notch. Now, I think I'm old enough to say that we live in uncertain times. And you hear people say that all the time, uncertain times. But I truly believe that today, the times are quite precarious. And Ms. Kadri, who gave the opening speech at K2020, too, she mentioned a couple of things. And one of them stuck with me, which was that there is a mirrored coming together of environmental, geopolitical, and economic factors which really create a momentum which we probably all will not easily forget in our lifetimes anymore. So the war, the energy and climate crisis, and not to forget, obviously, the future of our industry are all at stake. And sometimes it may feel there is little hope at all. I actually see this more as a transformation, as a change we're going to, and as a moment of where we need to seek and find the opportunity. And the opportunity is there. The opportunity is absolutely there. But change for this industry will need to take place. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. But it's the opportunities I choose to focus on, or we choose to focus on as an industry. And at the center of all of this is the war, the invasion of the Russians into Ukraine, and Ultimately, what that did is inadvertently, it made the Green Deal more important than it already was. Because what it did is, it accelerated it. It made that the European countries, the European Commission, looked at fossil feedstocks and wanted to cut their dependency even quicker than they had in mind already. Certainly the Russian ones, but also other fossil feedstocks. So what you saw was that renewable energy became at front and center of the discussion. And the target was upped. The target for 2030 for renewable energy now stands at 45% to be achieved as part of the Fit for 55 program by the European Union to ultimately reduce greenhouse gases by 55% by 2030. That's a very admirable and bold target which is put out there. And it really sets renewable energy at the core of the energy security policies going forward, which is incredibly important because it sets out the investment for the industry. You see the investment accelerating. You see it in solar. You see it in wind, offshore wind. You see it in hydrogen. All of these forms of energy are absolutely needed by our industry and will help shape us to ultimately get to net carbon. Now, circularity we can't forget at the same time. And we remain committed, as you've seen around, to circularity. And as Plastics Europe, we launched a report which is called Reshaping Plastics earlier this year. And in that report, it clearly stated and proved that the most effective, affordable, and quickest way to achieve net zero carbon would be through circularity. Using waste plastics 
as well as ultimately turning them into circular feedstocks and cutting our dependency on fossil feedstocks to create an economy which ultimately is circular. But to achieve that, we need to collaborate. I talked about that a little bit yesterday, and we need to improve our collaboration throughout the value chain. And if I can give you one example, if we ultimately want to achieve what I just summed up, we really need to make sure that we get to a collaboration which was super effective in the sense like a COVID-19 vaccine development where companies, science, investors, government all came together and were able in record time to develop innovative groundbreaking vaccines which have saved many people's lives. That's what we need to do. Now, if I look forward, I see three key principles which are needed to be able to effectuate that. The first one, which is really important and cannot be underestimated, is very effective policy frameworks for the whole value chain. Not just a part of it, the whole value chain. And it should be based on two key principles. The first principle should be material or techno technology neutrality. The second principle, it should be based on holistic LCA science-based assessments. The other part is innovation. Innovation in process, innovation in materials to ultimately advance circularity and decarbonization. And last but not least is collaboration. Collaboration to be able to scale up and advance the solutions, which in many cases we already have at hand, but just effectuate them and scale them up. Now, if we take a little bit of a step back and we look at the time we live in today with the energy crisis at hand, we need to conclude that our industry is in a crisis mode. Our industry is going through a very, very tough time. The competitiveness of Europe's industry is at stake. The jobs are at stake. And if we're not careful, we will see lots of investment and businesses going abroad and with that, also the investment which is needed to effectuate the transformation to a circular and decarbonized world. So we need to be incredibly careful. So it's more important now than ever that we create these effective policies and that we call upon policymakers to support the industry to be able to become competitive again. Competitiveness in the sense of effective and abundant fossil feedstocks from a circularity perspective, uh, enough renewable energy, but also ultimately harnessing the power of the EU single market. And ultimately, that should help us become and create an industry in Europe which is competitive again. If you look at the next three to five years, we will need to take many decisions decisions which will lay out the pathways for our industries because the industry works with long cycles so whatever we decide today will be decisive for the future of this industry so it's incredibly important to take and take that into mind and if you walk around this show to me it really demonstrates the speed the willingness of the whole value chain to change and to innovate and if I look at my own members in the industry association, they are taking a revamp of their production processes, their solutions, their products, which ultimately looking at investments in recycling technologies, be it mechanical recycling, chemical recycling, or any other form of recycling technology, but also looking at scope one and two to reduce your carbon emissions from a production process, and also investing in renewable energy, and ultimately, not to forget making sure that your feedstocks you're using are decoupled from virgin fossil feedstocks by using bio or ultimately circular feedstocks. So we as an industry, we're committed. We are willing to move to a circular and decarbonized world. I think you see that with the innovation displayed at hand here at the show as well. And we're continuing to move forward with the collaboration throughout the whole value chain. I don't think the difficulties ahead are actually the technological advancements we need to make. I don't believe that. I think they're there. Sure, we need innovation. But what we need above all is the will 
the will of the people to actually move to this new destiny, to change, to get out of their comfort zone and be willing to change. So with that, I would actually want to conclude and say, you know what, just do it and try it. It will be fun. Thank you so much. Now with that, I actually have the pleasure to invite David Katz on stage. David, if you can join me on stage, that would be a pleasure. Good morning, everyone. Good David, morning. David is the founder of Plastic Bank. David is also named as one of the world's most compassionate entrepreneurs by Saul Magazine. He's the recipient of the United Nations Lighthouse Award for Planetary Health. He's a recipient of the Paris Climate Conference Sustainability Community Award. And he's also a recipient of the Ernst & Young Lifetime Achievement Award. I think you get the gist. We've got somebody here who accomplished something. Um, and I could go on and on. But he's also the founder of Plastic Bank, which is an internationally recognized solution for ocean plastic. And Plastic Bank partners with the likes of Henkel, SC Johnson, Scancom, Carbon Pack, on and on and on and on. And I'm very pleased he's here today with us to actually discuss the social impact, David, you're making with your organization. So Thank please you. take a seat Thank you. and let's have a discussion. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for attending and everyone in the back as well. I acknowledge all of you for being here. <laughs> <laughs> David, let me start with um, what, what inspired you to set up Plastic Bank? What, what got you going and, and what's the model of Plastic Bank we should get excited about? It's a, that's a lot. I recognize that something needed to be done. Decades ago, growing up on the west coast of Canada, growing up on an island, I began witnessing the degradation of the marine ecosystem then. Just as a child, beginning to witness that, it was in my thinking as I traveled to the shores of the world. Inspired by that, witnessing of the death of life, of course. Well, the plastic bank, what have I done in the world? Ultimately, we've created a, a beautiful opportunity for the world to recognize the absolute value of the material of plastic. Well, let me ask the audience, if every piece of packaging, every bottle, everything that we ever encountered was easily exchangeable for five euro how many would we still see flowing into the ocean? Any? Well, we all know that we would see none in the ocean. We recognize as well that the majority of land-based debris entering the ocean is coming from areas of poverty. Yeah. Over 80% of it is entering from areas where people have no recycling infrastructure whatsoever. And imagine in those locations, if every piece of material was worth five euro, Certainly nothing entering the ocean, which is why we created Plastic Bank, which we communicate as a global chain of stores for the emerging. A store where everything is available to be purchased using plastic. We're proud that we offer access to school tuition, to medical insurance, to Wi-Fi, cooking fuel, water filtration, Everything the world needs but has always struggled to afford, now available using materials that would otherwise flow into the ocean as a money. Inside of it, we've created a blockchain-based banking application. You see, we've created a currency of the material, revealing the inherent value already in that resource. The banking application provides financial inclusion it provides banking for the world's emerging that it would never have had the opportunity to have it before. That provides access to loans or credit worthiness, the, able, the ability to borrow against the value of the material that you've collected and returned. To have a sense of safety and security from it. You see, what we've done is we've revealed the absolute value inside of it to such a paradigm that it's never, ever again viewed as waste. That's in a nutshell of what we do. We operate around the world. We started off in Haiti, which was crazy. We went to the Philippines, Indonesia, Brazil, 
Egypt now opening Cameroon and Thailand, now looking at the rest of North Africa as we continue to expand throughout Southeast Asia. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of locations around the world where we engage the emerging and provide opportunity and hope and collect mass volumes of material that are returned to amazing organizations who have chosen to stand on the right side of history by using what we call social plastic. Social plastic, a value that is transferred through the lives of the people who encounter it. Great companies like Henkel buy a bottle of Nature Box or another product, and you are, in fact, working with the world's emerging to help end suffering and stop plastic from entering the ocean at the same time. Collecting and returning tens of thousands of tons of material to manufacturing. That's it in a nutshell. Uh, <laughs> that's a lot to take yeah. in, David. Um, hey, and collaboration is key in all yes. of this. So how do you collaborate with governments, NGOs, brands, recyclers, resin producers? How do you mm -hmm. do that? You know, I have a conversation that, that, that communicates a man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. Uh, you mentioned quite a few different stakeholders there, but I don't try to make people do anything. We invite people into a different way of being, and those people we invite to make change. But I will attest that everything only occurs in collaboration. It only occurs in a relationship. You can have an amazing idea, but if it's not shared, it will never be implemented. It is only through that. Now, where we work, government certainly can be corrupt, and those may be challenges as well. We ultimately collaborate with amazing people wanting to make amazing change. Those that aren't waiting for it to be perfect, but want to participate in making it so. Brands like Henkel are certainly an amazing partner that brought us forward into the world, that made a commitment years ago, took risk when we were just a small, small startup. Look where we are today. But there is space for everyone. There's certainly space for the industry. There's certainly space for anyone in the audience. If you are somehow associated into the industry and you have some expertise, some knowledge, please come find us. It is only in collaboration that we'll change the world. So I'm here on stage as an invitation for you and the organization you're with to collaborate. So, so, so David, you talked about if a bottle would be five euros, how many bottles would still float in the ocean? I would completely agree. So the throwaway culture is at the heart of all of it this. It also exhibits that it's not the plastic. Yeah. It's us. Yeah. It has nothing to do with the material, everyone. It's the way we have been viewing it. We as consumers have been viewing the material. Change the way you think and you change your life. And it, I think it, it's an important, important dis distinction here. I, I think it's a really important distinction. And then when, you, when we're actually talking about adding value to plastic, which is the, the, the crux and the key to all of this, how are you actually doing that? And how do you ensure? It's not even adding value. It's about revealing the inherent value in the material. And this is a great part about what we do because when you can take um, we just returned from Manila. I, I'm, I'm proud of the story that we have two partners there in Manila that have 2,500 pharmacies. 2,500 pharmacies where now are tens of thousands of collectors can collect plastic to pay for pain relief and medications. Yeah, it's fantastic. It, it's just a profound shift. Imagine, maybe you don't know how many children die today around the world from fever absolutely preventable death, but they don't have the access to basic pain relief, fever relief. And imagine being a mother or a father in that condition where you know it's solvable, but to you, inaccessible. But now you get to look at the material a little bit differently because it'd be very simple for you to go and collect that material or ultimately store the material that you engage with. All the material that comes into your, host now, into your house now an additional source of income, which you can now go to the pharmacy and ultimately have access to those medic medicines. You see, that's, that's a part of the revealing the value. It's not necessarily the material or the money, but what it gets. 
this is what we've become renowned for. Or within Haiti, as we began a program where, where 200,000 children cannot have access to education there, the government doesn't provide the education, the household has to pay the $20 a month, and it's inaccessible. But now using plastic, and schools are our collection locations. So a school is a plastic bank branch where we teach the children to teach the parents to instead of burning the material or throwing it in the canal, to bring it to the school as a collection location and it pays for the tuition. You see, because now the parent looks at it differently as well. It's not the plastic. Now it's viewed as the end of poverty because mm -hmm. poverty will never leave the family unless you have education in the, with the children. Yep. You see, it's not just the material. It's not just the value of the material, but what it can changes do for the them. It yep. changes lives. Yep. And that is how we reveal the value in the material. And that is what's accessible to everybody in the industry. Yeah, I think that will inspire everybody, David. I think there's nobody here in the audience today who wouldn't say that that is not uh, worthy of inspiration and exciting uh, what you're trying to do. And, and, and how do you sell uh, in terms of selling the recycled plastics? You've got the trademark, social plastics. Social plastic. Tell yeah. me more about that. Well, we provide a space for every consumer and the recognition that every time they buy something, by the way, everybody, if you're here because you're somewhat inspired by it, and you think something needs to change in the world, which I think we can all agree that we need to do something. Remember that every time you buy something, you vote. Don't forget, you can't be in the audience. You can't be a human in the world with a recognition that someone needs to do something about it and maintain your poor behavior. Do you need that single use material? Do you need the stir stick? Do you need the lid? Do you need things that are overpackaged? Do you need to buy things that are degrading humanity? No. Vote for that that you wish. Go into a store, ask the store for those materials that have regenerated society, repaired the oceans, repaired mm. humanity. Create the demand for change. You're all powerful participants. So, and as that consumer, and as we do that, brands, whether they choose to or not, although Henkel very authentic, other ones recognize that the next generation of consumer is looking for that and they are participating in a material that has that powerful, beautiful connection, that story. So that every time you do buy something, the world does get better. That's the change. The previous question, I'm not waiting for government or business. I'm launching a movement, a renaissance, a revolution where we're putting the hands, the power in the hands of the consumers. And be committed to work at those organizations that are standing forward for it with change. Because that's also driving it. Mindshare, the next realm of executive, the next powerful executive, the next generation that is standing for change. Yeah, that brings to purpose. And purpose, uh, purpose is incredibly important in this. Also for this, eh, we talked a little bit about that yesterday as well, David. Uh, and you asked me about the purpose for this industry as well which is incredibly important because we will not change the industry if we are not able to attract the talent and the mind share of the people who've got the brains to be able to change this, this industry. We need to make sure that we are credible and that we actually follow that pathway and have proof points along the way that we're doing. We can't wait, I think you said that yesterday, for perfection to be implemented before we start doing something. We can do something today. I'm, I'm fully with you, that, that's, that's absolutely the case. If we talk about scale, <coughs> how, do we, how can we bring your concept to scale? Because there's so much more to do, there is, as you yeah. would be the first one eh, to acknowledge. Um, how, do we, how do we make that change happen? How do we get the mindset to change? You, you, know, you, know, you listed, elicited the conversation in your previous statement. The perfect, the perfect is the enemy of the good enough. The perfect is the enemy of the good enough and what the world needs is action starting. Do something. Look how many booths have the word sustainable and circular on them. Do we see action? I love the expression, I can't hear what you say because what you do screams so loudly. Show me action and then I'll listen. Mm -hmm. Create a paradigm where it doesn't need to be perfect. Create a paradigm where the material itself on the shelf doesn't need to look like it's a virgin feedstock. Create the paradigm for the world to participate. Make investments where they're needed. Invest in early startup. 
participate with those who are inspired to make change. There's so much that we can do. I could go on and on and on. If we take the hundreds of billions of dollars in the industry and create more circularity. And, and, and what role in all of this, David, place technology and how do you uh, ensure the traceability of that material to yeah. kind of create the circularity the impact of it yeah you know i'm i'm not i think yes of, of course but i think that what is driving that is authenticity so how might we then substantiate authenticity transparency traceability for the world because we're all too familiar with the conversations with little action we're all too familiar with the words greenwashing and others show me that you're doing well, which is why with Plastic Bank, we made the very, very early decision almost, almost eight years ago to create a blockchain-based banking application. Irrefutable. What we need is authenticity in the world, and if we need to engage technology to do so, let it be. That's the way we use a technology. Now, I'm also inspired with the knowing that nothing that the world needs to do is against the laws of physics. This is not insurmountable, it's not unsolvable. I could express that some of the, some of the materials that I see on the show, that for me is mind-bending. How is it produced? It seems like it's against physics. What we need to do to create recycling infrastructure at a very base level for the world's emerging is very rudimentary. It in fact doesn't require a lot of technology. Mechanical recycling is good enough, but yet we can apply technology. There are ways to multiply. There are ways to give exponentiality to what we do. Mm -hmm. Let's look for how we might provide more value through technology, through information and sharing information. There's just no end of ways that we could be using it's technology. It's a means, it's not it's the It's a end. means, it's not yeah. the ends. And yeah. it's not a requirement either. Exactly. This is the thing, don't make it so complicated. It's not. Start. Start. I think we can all take that to heart. That's, that's, that's a really good piece of advice. Now you're also known as the champion of the poor and with respect to many of the work you've done, uh, particularly your experience in working in many of the developing regions and coastal areas which are very much at mm -hmm. risk of all of this mm -hmm. waste plastic, what are some of the experiences you can share with us? Oh, uh, whew, where do I start? Wow, it's amazing. <coughs> the work we do is so beautiful, it's ridiculous. Uh, I have so many beautiful experiences, so many beautiful stories. It's been, s oh man, it uses me, this whole thing, it's crazy. You know, I had an idea for Plastic Bank uh, and I committed myself to it when I, it was May the 9th, 2013, before, <laughs> right before lunch where I had the idea and it's been with me that whole process, but, the first time that it really used me is when we were in Haiti. We, we created a new model for collection from cooperatives where we brought individuals in, in, in downtown Port-au-Prince that were living in plastic sheets and tents, the homeless, that were collecting materials. We created a cooperative. We created a set of bylaws. We appointed someone to run them all so they could all support each other. So if someone was sick, they'd still be able to be taken care of, that type of thing. And, and Jean, who, who we appointed the president of the group at that time, through our translator on the ground, when I asked about how it was going with his two little girls that were just very young, four, five, six. And this is a man that was in abject poverty, struggling for food. <clears throat> I said, Jean, how is it going? He says, oh, David, now for the first time ever, I can see my children going to university Ooh, we took a man who couldn't see to the end of the day, and now he could see a decade in the future. Mm -hmm. You see, I witnessed then, not just the end of his poverty, but I also, I witnessed the end of my poverty that day. I recognized what it was to truly powerfully be in service. I understood what it was to do for another and the gift of that life. And that's what we powerfully bring forward to the consumer and to the brand and to the material itself. What is it like to be in service? What value lies there? I think it's incredibly important. And what you're stating is, you see th there's two different worlds, obviously. We're here in Europe, we're in Germany. Collection is pretty well set up. 
circularity needs to improve. We need to design our packaging to become recyclable. We need to do better I, with I, that. I, but I in the challenge that. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. I challenge that because it's beyond that. Circularity is still linear, everybody. We, we have to move past that whole conversation of sustainability because it's BS and it's BS in the consumer. And they recognize that saying that, oh, we're going to sustain what's occurring in society is horrible. 200 species of plant, insect, and animal are going extinct every day. Is that what we're sustaining? We have to lead to the regenerative economy. We have to lead to regeneration. We have to lead a new economy that repairs the damage that's been done. Circularity is not enough at all. And let's be clear, clear, irrefutable. Challenge me if you wish, but the ocean and the earth and the climate are going to be just fine. Why are you considering it? It's a ridiculous thought. The ocean is gonna be com completely comprehensively restored, climate returned. That's a for sure. We won't be here. But the earth and the ocean, fine. It's not save the ocean day, it's save humanity day and it should be every day. We have to be in action, everyone. It's so short-sighted to think it's about the ocean. So, so let me bring it back then to the industry and how do you perceive the industry? What role could we play to facilitate and support your ambitions and what piece of advice do you have for yeah, us? Yeah, we could, we certainly, the industry could certainly create a paradigm for the use of the material, ask for the material, create the category social plastic further, provide a paradigm for organizations that have consumer facing brands or packaging brands or automotive or whoever you want to be able to use a material that helps society lift. That's a for sure minimum table stakes. It certainly could work within our, our ecosystems to provide the recycling communities we have with additional <coughs> technical expertise, help us add more value in those communities. It could also steward against things like multi-layer sachet. It could mm -hmm. work faster to create alternatives so that we can still serve the poor without killing the planet or ourselves. There's no end of opportunity for the industry to participate. I fully agree. I fully agree, David, and, and I think in many respects and many elements, the industry is collaborating either through and Is it cl collaborating through. fast enough? Exactly, and that's the question. Can we do it quicker? Can we do it better? But to your point of perfection, I think we need to avoid that we strive for perfection. We need to start somewhere. We need to fail, fail fast, do it again. Fail fast. And learn, and learn, and go on. No, I agree, I agree. Let me, if you're okay, let me ask the audience as well whether there's some questions because- Oh, there must be questions. You heard, you heard yeah. David talk. There must He's be questions. Ask, please ask. It adds to, it adds to the conversation. Even as a consumer or someone in the industry, speak from your, your role. I'd love to be able to be challenged. Yes, do you have a question? No, it's like being at the auction, putting up your hand ah, by accident. There you go. <laughs> I think there's a question there if there, somebody can make a mic, yeah. Hi, um, not quite. Good morning. Was a, good morning, really. Thank you for asking. Powerful, powerful speech. But I guess I want to ask, um, you talk about the individual person making a choice, like not use a stir or stick or something like that. But isn't the larger problem with plastic as a material, and I say this as a journalist for Plastics News, the virgin material is so cheap that the economics of the recycling systems just fundamentally are really challenged. So I, as an individual, can make all the right choices, but if the economics of it don't work, and I'm, and I'm not arguing against recycling by saying that, I'm saying how do we deal with that issue, so. Yeah, and, and, it's, and it's a powerful one, and that's what the brands ask as well, and other people are asking, like, oh, virgin plastic, the plastic itself, bad. Well, look around these 17 halls, tell me that you're gonna stop the industry from emerging and, and continuing to grow. We're not fighting against it. We can't, you know, whatever you resist persists, and set all of that aside. What we find now is that the organizations are willing to participate with us or wanting to, have an inability to hire great talent because the new emerging executive is one that wants purpose, that wants to participate in the human endeavor of change. 
and that is the economics, as well as the next generation of consumer who is also looking to participate in change. I'll tell you, my 16-year-old is immensely proud of her vintage clothing. She likes the odd new piece, but they go every weekend to the vintage stores to find used clothes because that's the new cool. The new cool is participating in change, not in degradation. And so the economics are shifting. And that's what we see happening. And yes, there's a long way to go. And yes, virgin plastic. And yes, sometimes government could participate by taxing what they don't want to have happen. Tax virgin plastic, perhaps. Drive more resource in industry to recycling. Create a <clears throat> easier platform for material to be returned to, to manufacturing. Lower the standard or the barriers for people to use material where they're perhaps too onerous. There's a lot of things that need to occur. And thank you for the question because it's important. Yeah, and I, I think just to add to your question, I, I think you're absolutely right, David. And, and just to add to that, the brands clearly made commitments. They made yes. commitments, so they should live up to those commitments with respect to circularity and taking up recycled content. And that's where it starts with the demand. If the demand is there, then the actual economics ultimately will work. And what yes. you will see over the next decade is that the share of virgin fossil produced plastics will continue to decline, particularly here in Europe, because of the enabling policy framework which has been put in place. So you do see that decline and recycling will become more economic. I would actually challenge you on that statement you made that recycling may not be economical. If you look at it today, there is an enormous amount of investment by either private equity, who never looked at recycling as an attractive industry before, the resin producers who jump in, who never thought it was an attractive industry, but now because of the demand, the end consumer, the brands who are jumping in, it becomes a very attractive place combined with the enabling policy framework. But it's a good question, thanks. Yeah, sorry there, um, gentlemen. Can, can, can somebody bring the mic here? Could you speak it out loud and I'll repeat it? Man. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. yes. We're active as a supplier in the, in the rope and netting industry, so the marine. Mm. And the whole sustainability is a big thing for us. Sure. But the biggest challenge we see is that, first of all, the nets, the ropes, it's all combinations of ma materials. And then the recycling people, they go through the roof. And secondly, we seriously run, especially in Europe, into legislative issues so that depending on where you land the, recy the material you want to discard rather than throw in the sea, mm -hmm. where you land, it depends on how much it's going to cost or bring you as a benefit. So that's, those are two very big issues for us yeah, thank you for speaking up from that paradigm, how important it is to be able to be in the stewardship of the ocean through commercial fishing e equipment as well, which are would, a catastrophe. Every floating net, discarded net, the, you know, continues to murder as it drifts. So much it needs to occur. And regulation and more government and speaking up. And I'm, I'm hopeful that the next generation of, of, of consumer, but human, the one this is inspired will as well be the next generation of government official. It needs to be happening now, I agree, and more needs to be done. I would love to know how I can support you as well. I'm not sure if you had a question or more of a statement, but <laughs> I'm in agreement with it. Okay, yeah. I, 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 and I think the one comment I wanna uh, hang on to is the multiple materials, which you were uh, alluding to with the fishing nets. Uh, th that is a problem, and that is something we as an industry recognize as well. And this comes back to my earlier point on designing for recyclability, making sure that you think with the end in mind that your product is recyclable, that you work with the whole value chain to make that a reality, because that is absolutely key. Because then whatever comes up is recyclable and there is actually a value to it as well. At the right. moment, it's a problem. Very true. Same with packaging. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. A any plastic material. Yeah, for designed for yeah. recyclability. Yeah, yeah, it goes for everything. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, the gentleman here in front. Uh, can anybody bring a microphone over, please? He's coming, taking the long way. <laughs> I would like to focus on uh, what you said about just start. Uh, you know, we have we are near the River Rhine, 
and obviously there's plastic to be found there as well. And then every now and then there is a clear the river Rhine day. But it should be something that should be done every, every day. And I'm most impressed. Uh, oh, uh, I used to go sailing in Holland and the Dutch islands. And many years ago, they started putting, uh, wherever you approach the beach, can approach the beach, they, first they put up just a plastic bag and a, a little sign. Uh, if you walk along the beach and you find something, put it in there. Then they brought in uh, the artistic uh, uh, community and they used, they used um, the, 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 caps, the, the, the caps to make big pictures, uh, landscapes, and then they just, uh, day by day or week by week, they increased the containers where people put their stuff, and now they almost have to clean it, to clean the container every day. Beautiful. I think there's a beautiful right. Idea. Well, there's a should, gamification inside of that. Yes, you we see should, you engaged yes. people to participate in something bigger. Yes, we ought to we ought to do Replicate. this on the River Rhine every single day. I, and there's so many things we need to do, yeah. and we need an army of solutions executed by an army of people. And this is a thing for humanity, so we all need to be in that execution. I would challenge you as well to participate in that. Create that. Yeah. Thank you. Oh. You oh, tried. Great. Thank you. And thank you for being an ocean advocate. Thank you. Yeah. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Okay. <laughs> um, first of all, hugely motivating. Very inspiring. Um, as Marco alluded to, we're in Europe, and we have a different challenge when it comes to plastic and the waste issue in Europe compared to the places sure. that you're working in. Do you see your model being able to be applied within Europe as well, where there are sorting and collection challenges in you know, neighboring countries such as Romania? Um, and how can we kind of build that into our own kind of strategic thinking and modeling and, and then the mindset shift? Oh, absolutely, it's required. Now, we're just started in places where the most land-based the, where land-based debris is entering the ocean the fastest, so we're turning off the tap. We created the paradigm of not cleaning the ocean, but stopping the tap of plastic from flowing into the ocean. So that's where we're operating, but this is a model that should be executed internationally, of course. Even in the city of Los Angeles has 70,000 70, people who are homeless in Los Angeles. Set aside what's occurring here. So it's certainly an opportunity to transfer value into the hands of the people who can be incentivized to create value, to create dignity, self-reliance and everything else. The material is remarkable. We are doing as much as we are doing, living as long as we're living because of plastic. We need to continue to see the beauty and the gift and the value of it, not just in its single use, but in its return and circularity. Mm -hmm. And then continue to share the value through the lives of the people who encounter it, the rich or the poor. Because there's poverty everywhere. It's poverty everywhere. There's need everywhere. Need everywhere. Very good point. Yeah. Any last questions, remarks, comments? Comments? I'd love a comment. Exact. It doesn't have to be a question. Anything? Opinions? Anyone in the back? Opinions. I like opinions too. No? No? Thank you very much, everybody. Well, David, let uh, me thank you. I mean, man. What an energy, what an <laughs> ambition, what a passion. Can we give David a big round of applause? <laughs> Thank you so much, David. <laughs> Thank you, man. Thank I really you. appreciate Thank it. You. Thank, Thank you. you so Thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank and you. I, I'm, here I'm, I'm here, I'm walking around, happy to take questions, be engaged. Perhaps you represent an organization, a company of some sort that would like to participate, perhaps build the feedstock, supply chain. There are ways to participate with Plastic Bank. We're in Hall 8B. Booth 413A13, come and visit us there. Uh, we've been overwhelmed by the support. We've been overwhelmed by organizations that want to participate in purchasing a social plastic feedstock. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thanks you again. very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.